All right, example six, uh, we have a lot of stuff going on. Um, first of all, we want to focus on what we're asked to find. We're asked to find intervals of increasing and decreasing. And remember that this idea of increasing and decreasing intervals is tied to the slope of the tangent line. And that's really important because the tangent line formula comes from the first derivative. So um, first derivative um, is used when we're looking for increasing and decreasing intervals, and that's really important. So the first thing we want to do when we know we're looking for increasing and decreasing intervals is we want to look for the first derivative. Okay, so once again, really important when you're on the test that when you're looking for a first derivative that we remember what formula that we need to use. So we see that we have a, a fraction with a variable on top and the variable on the bottom. Um, it looks like we are going to use then the quotient rule. So we're going to start at the bottom. Okay, so it's the denominator as is, times the derivative of the numerator, which is 1, minus, the negative is important, minus the numerator as is, times the derivative of the denominator, which would be 2x. All of that over the original denominator, we're going to take that, put in the parentheses, and we're going to square it. Now I do want to simplify this because we're going to use it. So we're going to distribute the 1. Multiply negative x times 2x, that's negative at 2x squared. I'm going to simplify a little bit more. Combine my like terms at the top. Positive 1x squared and minus 2x squared, that gives us negative 1x squared minus 3. All of that over x squared minus 3, parentheses squared. I'm going to get rid of the, the 1 here. We don't usually write it, we don't need it. So this is my first derivative. So step one, when we're asked for increasing and decreasing intervals, is to find the first derivative. Um, the second thing that we want to do is we want to look for where the first derivative might equal zero, or where the first derivative would come out undefined. So we want to look for x values that would cause these outputs from the first derivative. Um, let's look for where the first derivative would spit out a zero first. So I'm going to take the first derivative, and I'm going to set it equal to 0, and we're going to solve for x. So in order to do this, I'm going to put this over 1. It turns out that it's, this is not really uh, too bad here, because when we multiply 0 times the denominator, I get, the, I get 0, which is nice. And then negative x squared minus 3 times 1 is just negative x squared minus 3. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. All right, and I'm going to bring over the x squared to the other side, so that becomes a positive x squared equals negative 3. And we get an answer pretty quickly here because when we take the square root of both sides, remember that the square root of, an, of a negative number is imaginary. So since we get some imaginary number, then we're going to say for this particular problem that uh, there is no solution here for an x value that will cause our derivative, our first derivative to equal zero. So we don't get any x values for our number line from that. So we're going to go on to the next part, what would cause the first derivative to come back undefined. In other words, what would cause the, the denominator to equal zero? So we're going to take that denominator as is, we're going to set it equal to zero, see what would cause that to happen. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides, get x squared minus 3 equals 0. I'm going to add 3 to both sides, and now I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Now I do want to remember to include my plus and minus, so I get plus or minus the square root of 3. So we get two, two values that we're going to use to separate um, the intervals on our number line. So I'm going to draw my number line here, and I'm going to put my two values on. So I get negative square root of 3, positive square root of 3. Remember when we solve those, solve for those x values, those are the ones we're going to put in the boxes and those are the ones we're going to use to separate our intervals and give our answers. Um, so, first of all, um, in our calculators we might want to know what the square root of 3 is. Since it's not a nice round number, let's approximate that. Put that into our calculator, we get about 1.7. So about negative 1.7 and positive 1.7. So I'm going to choose something to the left of that. I'm going to choose, let's say, negative 2 as my test value. Remember, step 3 is to 
write out your number line, choose some test values in and around. Okay, so we get negative 2. Scoot this up. Um, and in between a negative number and a positive number, we always have 0, which is really nice and easy. And then on the other side, let's go ahead and just choose a positive 2. Now remember what we're doing here, we're putting all of that into our first derivative. We're trying to find the slope at each one of these points. So what's the slope of the tangent line at negative 2? Um, so we're going to use our first derivative. Remember that's our slope formula. So we're going to put negative 2 in, and I'm going to use one of our, our little tricks that we've already used. Um, in the denominator, the denominator, the last thing that we do in the denominator is always square it. So our denominator will always come back positive. So for all of these, I can go ahead and just put that down, denominator, regardless of what I do here. Let's give ourselves a little bit more room for that one. Okay, our denominator will always come back positive, so do that. And what about the numerator? A little bit of thought about my numerator would tell me that my numerator would always come back negative. And you can plug it in. One thing you want to be careful about is this negative is not included as part of the squaring, so if I was to fill this out, it would be negative, and then that would be on the outside of the parentheses, squared, minus 3. If I put the negative 2 in the parentheses, order of operations would tell me that the first thing I have to do is take the 2, the negative 2, and square it. So that would give me 4, but the negative that's on the outside of that x squared, that's on the outside of that squaring, would come on down. So I would end up with a negative 7 over some positive value. A negative divided by a positive is always negative. What does that tell us about our intervals? Well, this interval, the slope, comes back negative, which tells me that I have the tangent lines going downhill from left to right, which tells me that my interval is decreasing. Um, when we plug in 0, once again, um, this one's actually really easy. And I can go ahead and plug that in. We get 0 squared, which is 0, and then negative 0, which is 0. 0 minus 3. It's negative 3 over a plus. So once again, a negative divided by a positive, we end up with a negative. A negative slope tells us that the tangent lines are all decreasing or going downhill from left to right in between our two boxes. Okay, positive 2 would do the same thing. We have our negative 2, um, negative on the outside of the squaring. So 2 squared would be 4. The negative that's out front would come on down and we get the same thing we did before. We get negative 7 divided by a positive, which a negative divided by a positive is always going to simplify to be negative. So our tangent lines are going downhill, they're slanting downhill from left to right, so we have decreasing interval there as well. So can we say um, that we are increasing anywhere? So it looks like obviously we did not have any positive outcomes, so there are no increasing intervals for this entire function. So as we move from left to right, we're always decreasing. Now, can we say we're decreasing from negative infinity to positive infinity? Um, and to, um, Technically, no, we cannot, because what is happening here? Do we have um, asymptotes or holes, or what's going on? So let's look back. When we look at the original function, if we were to set the denominator equal to 0 here, we would find that we would have to toss out two values. We would have to toss out positive and negative square root of 3, which tells me that when I'm looking at the domain, I would end up with some asymptotes there. So these are both asymptotes. So there are these dotted vertical lines at negative square root of 3 and positive square root of 3. So those points, those x values are actually not included on the graph at all. So I can't say that I'm increasing or decreasing at those particular x values. So we're going to say that we're decreasing from negative infinity to negative square root of 3, and, and then again from negative square root of 3 to positive square root of 3, so we're decreasing in between the two, and then once again decreasing from positive square root of 3 to positive infinity. So technically we could not say that we're decreasing all the way across because we're neither increasing nor decreasing at these two asymptotes. Okay. Uh, relative max and relative min. Now this is really nice and easy because we never switch from increasing to decreasing, therefore we cannot have a uh, relative max or a relative min because there is no switch. So really nice and easy, there is no relative max 
and there is no relative minimum. Uh, one last thing, when we give our intervals, we always use the exact values whenever possible. So you notice that I didn't use negative 1.7 and positive 1.7. I used the exact value square root of 3 and negative square root of 3 in my answers for my intervals.